Well, what's it? Incentives and uh, knowledge and wisdom, huh? Um, oh, re- recreation as well. Oh, sorry, recreation. Didn't want to miss that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, now, um, Jacques talked about this quite well as well. I think it's mentioned in The Best That Money Can't Buy. I can't remember. I know he said it on some radio shows a couple of times. Um, mm. Recreation is what? Well, it's the use of a really nice technology, sporting equipment and space, uh, and a little bit of knowledge as well, rules um, and uh, and so forth, to govern some some interesting sport interaction that's more than just running on the spot. Right? It's an embellishment of, of physical action, Yeah. to put it in a stupidly. Um, intellectual way but if we remember it that way then we can also understand that in a a technologically advanced society you would have kick-ass sporting equipment Mm. Uh, right now we have artificial uh, runways for snow sorry artificial you know mountains we have indoor you know snow equipment um but just think what you could actually have if you really had proper resources to spare no money inhibition the ability to build something totally awesome because it's going to be totally awesome, not because it's got to be this big and be that, because that's all we can afford, and that's what we've sold people on already. Mm. Um, so you'd have damn good equipment. Now, Jacques takes it a little bit Star Trek-y, which is fun, and it will happen, I think, uh, that you can essentially play a holographic person of yourself, for example, at tennis. Yeah. Uh, that you could mirror back your abilities in some sort of mash-up way, right, some kind of collage that's governed by what you're doing now, and it sort of, you know, fights back at you. Can you beat yourself? Mm. Now, as fun as that sounds, we don't have to think about it that way, but that is something that will be ultimately possible. We already have a similar thing for golf, where you just whack it into a net, and it actually tells you how far it would have gone. So mm. we do have artificial environments, but on a very simple level. But those will grow, they'll get better, they'll become more inclusive. But I think also, quite importantly, because we're now really clearing up the environment because that's an implicit thing you have to have a good environment to have good people hence the environment has like so-called earth rights essentially Um, there are rights to the environment they must be so you see Um, you'd have that and of course you have less socio-economic stress you don't really have any you'd like to have none it'd be there's always going to be something but it's a little bit like the stress of a necessary funeral for example you know it's one of those things you go through in life everyone will go through Mm. uh, versus irrational stress about things that don't matter um so you know it's those kinds of differences so people can now play outside there isn't so much damn crime right Mm. the era when kids could play outside unwatched has already existed people lament its loss that's going to have to come back in the form of a byproduct of a system that's genuinely supportive absolutely not neighborhood watch schemes that's a waste of metal actually if you keep putting those signs up right Mm. Uh, and stickers uh, Real Neighborhood Watch is to build the watching in the sense of the support for every human being. Everybody could be your neighbor at some point. You want to make sure they're all OK. right? And they're mm. all OK. Hence, you have an environment that you can play in properly. And people can start rediscovering the environment. Modern kids don't know grass all that well <laughs> compared to how we used to when it was a, a hoop and a dirt road. Of course, we don't want to do that again. But it was mm. outside and it was unhindered. It was essentially safe. So all of that comes through as well. We have the ability suddenly to use larger recreational spaces. The air is going to have to be good quality. Hence, it's actually good for us. We don't uh, all start developing cancers later on in our lives based Mm. on continuous exposure to the negative physical effects of everything that we've got surrounding us. So all of that comes in as well. So, yeah, fitter, healthier, more productive and all the rest of it. Mm. Yeah, to quote. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess this us does lead us on to uh, to the next thing. I, you know, in my experience, it's definitely a big uh, topic that the the vast majority of the time I always encounter this one is um is the issue of incentives. Like, yeah. you know, people people ask me, but what would you do? What would I do in in a in a resource based economy? I I wouldn't want to sit around all day playing video games. Yeah, absolutely. What motivates people? Mm. Um, it's very interesting, isn't it? Um, every th- I was thinking about this the other day, just because I'm preparing something for um, for Monday uh, down in London. Um, you know, everything that we do in society, every interaction, is in order to get money, so that we can have been paid in arrears, so that we can then support ourselves. In other words, everything we do begins with, well, we'll pay you once it's done, with a few exceptions. There are exceptions to that. Mm. But because money is debt, really, if you think about it, even if you're getting paid, you're being given liabilities of someone else, right? So someone else is 
you know, having to go to, to have some loan first before ultimate, uh, you know, life good, life support. Mm. Um, so we do tend to think, well, I wouldn't do anything for free because we know that we do almost everything um, in arrears before we even get paid. There's a real resentment at the heart of this. Yeah. And it's an, it's a just resentment. That's the thing. We often say, you know, you know, don't be too negative and all the rest of it. And, you know, don't lash out at the, you know, the people in the system, but you can, you can essentially, essentially see how people do feel like they've been exploited and how that exploitation puts their guard up to entertaining the notion of doing something without reward, not seeing that if you didn't need the reward in the sense of having everything that the reward usually allows you to buy, right? Mm. If you had that sorted already, don't you see that your, your attitude would be completely different? You would be like, well, you know, I don't feel so damn exploited. I can do things voluntarily for the first time, absent um, a currency, absent something that can be controlled and something that can skew the way that I can behave normally. Um, mm. You know, I think incentive would rock it. Um, I mean, there's the, the, the facile points that we've made before that people like Nikola Tesla and, you know, Albert Einstein and all these people, they didn't do it for the money. Um, no. And, you know, their discoveries of what we can probably name about 20 people, probably less, who have changed everything. Yeah. I mean, Tesla alone is, you know, it's pretty much electricity, <laughs> you know, yeah, pretty, pretty much. much the way that it's available. It's completely him. Uh, you know, obviously, there are people before him. We talk about that, too. Knowledge is cumulative. And we are hoping that we inherit the common goods of it. And that happens to some extent. You and I, like we've said before, having an essentially free conversation on technology we don't understand, right? We've just got it, right? Mm. Uh, you know, I don't know how it got that way. As Joe Rogan says, maybe it was magic, right? <laughs> um, in fact, he's on tonight, isn't he? Right. Yes, yeah, midnight tonight, yeah. That's right. Um, so let me pick up my threads here. So I think incentives will rocket. I think that the ability to innovate will rocket and people will invent way more and that will spur more people to invent more. And gradually we start inventing things that invent things and gradually we start our inventions turn to very different kinds of things as well. We essentially mm. will reach, we will reach that what people call the singularity, although that's a bit of an odd name for it. I think I know where I know what it's meant to mean, but people need to understand it in a very simple way. We're obviously evolving uh, artificial intelligence that we have no way of comprehending at all. Because it's, dub you know, everything doubles every year. Capacity mm. information about the brain. Uh, human knowledge doubles every 13 months. Can you imagine how, how a big jump that is every 13 months? Astronomical. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, and it's then twice what it was before and again and again and again. It, you know, if you, if you double from 1 to 30, you get a billion really quickly. Yeah. So, you know, um, with, with that um, kind of advent, we are going to have incentives that are in whole areas that we just won't work in anymore. It's going to be really quite strange. A little bit like how no one works in selling horses and carriages to general people. Mm. That isn't done anymore. That's a nope. thing that we don't need, right? But we did do it once. Nothing wrong with it. Got something better. It's gone, right? Mm -hmm. But it's going to be whole industries. It's going to be, I think, I think probably things like information technology will be probably around the middle of what gets automated because it's still got a high level of human interaction. But that'll mm. go. And with it, entire lines of products will disappear. And, you know, we will, I don't know. It's not that things are getting stripped down. It's that we have a tremendous amount of redundant uh, systems and things. And yeah. I think those will be shared. And, of course, that's where we say the abundance comes from. Yeah. Because we won't just be, you know, bred for an incentive to buy. It'll be an incentive that we know is supportive. So, you know, if anything, incentive has to be suppressed now by because of essentially the way that you're in arrears to everything. But that's yeah. going to and that's going to be a wonderful thing. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing. I mean, because I mean, one of the things I, I tell people every now and then is that when we teach our children uh, from the beginning, teach them how to go about certain things we teach them in the right way to begin with we teach mm -hmm. our kids to be nice to each other we teach our kids to share we yeah. teach our kids to sort out our problems the very things that we should all that we should be teaching everyone okay. and teaching ourselves yeah. the whole way through life right. and you know that that's what you know it really frustrates me that we we start off so well yeah. but because 
as the as the children grow up they say right well we recognize we don't like to admit it but we recognize that that wonderful incentive system it's brilliant it's altruistic it's humanistic or whatever label you want to put on it it's yeah. brilliant but it won't work in this current system. You have to be the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah. exactly. And you know, that's it, then, isn't it? And let's let's trace back to where it first happens. It's quite mm-hmm. tricky, isn't it? Because overtly, it probably first happens when that kid grows up and gets a job. Because yeah. then you are in the system, you're in the economic um, matrix, dude, uh, and in you know within the system and reliant upon it and then indebted to it as well. Actually, actually I'd, I'd probably trace it back point. quicker than uh, earlier than that. Actually, I oh no, say... well, I was going to say it's built in much earlier. For example, mm. what do Western kids wear? They wear clothes made by Eastern kids, right? Mm. And that's something that's built into their way that they're brought up, and that's the level we're talking about when we talk about how society is corrupt we're talking about how just being in it regardless of your moral ethical standpoint just being in it can be quite exploitative without you really understanding it and when you find out you're probably horrified and then it's very hard to not do because it's almost everything uh, yeah. <laughs> um, if you really look at you know if you trace back absolutely every interaction so um but that's isn't that what some people call alienation when you wake up and see how the how life really works? Yeah, they think oh it it's too it's too much for the brain to to handle. There's like there's only a certain level of corruption that I will allow to acknowledge. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and like, I think no, that's a very good point, and it's one that I make in I think an upcoming presentation. I think as a human race, and this leads into knowledge and wisdom a little bit, mm. we have had to blinker ourselves um, emotionally. We've forgotten how to feel because in feeling in a really rational and appropriate way, about a billion people starving on the planet is going to send you insane if you really felt what that is. Mm. It's so serious and we can't deal with it. So it's we we understand it's awful and we go, oh, God, that's terrible. And then we have to think about something else. and We have to operate because Mm. if we really did entertain that knowledge the way that it needs to be entertained, you would have huge changes overnight and you yeah. would have very, if there were no changes, you would have very depressed people. <laughs> yeah, you would have I mean, to self-destruct, I think, if you really felt the personal death of a billion people. Yeah, exactly. That's, and, I mean, yeah. that's why personally when, because um, I uh, I got hold of, um, of the documentary Collapse, the Michael yeah. Rupert documentary, and I, start, I started watching it and it, it was... It's almost as though it's like it's as hard hitting as Zeitgeist the movie yeah. in a certain way. But, you know, it's it's very, very hard hitting. And and I think I got to I think I got to the point where Mike starts to break down. Yeah. And I was just like, Christ, I've got to, I've got to switch this off. Mm. You know, I've got to ease myself slowly into this because it's just too much. I mean, even you even it, you make so, it true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, eventually, I, but it's it's just I had to like ease my way into it because you know there's certain things. I mean, that's why that's why I tend to um, you know take it easy with a lot of uh, Mike's material because you know I mean I understand that he's a very earnest man, but yeah. you know, f- um, and but he's got this resilience of mind that he he understands this stuff. He's dealt with it. Yeah. For long, for long enough that, that he's he, got a resilience to if, it. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at uh, Mike Rupert's background, um, you see where he came from. You know, was it South Central LA cop, right? Drug, drug, mm. the kind of stuff. That, I mean, because he blew the wrist, the whistle originally on uh, cops dealing drugs in South Central. Yeah, that was his story. And when he blew that whistle, man, he got shot at. He got, you know, disowned from, you know, or disavowed from the entire organization. Mm-hmm. And uh, he then blew the whistle on, on live TV, didn't he? That man has seen things that, um, you know, <laughs> would make us, you know, probably go mad. You'd have um, to and what's so amazing is, you know, it's a little bit like what you were saying. What's so amazing is when you watch Collapse, you go, man, he's been doing this for like, what is it, 20 years, 25? And he has known where to look because of where he started work. You know, he knows how to judge a system, where to find the data, how to interpret it, to, you know, judge it correctly or not. Um, but what's so amazing is that after all that time, he hasn't forgotten how to feel. He mm-hmm. is emotionally touched by this. He hasn't got used to it. 
And that, I think, is a good sign. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. I think that's a commendable sign, actually. I wrote to him and told him that. He never replied because he's too busy with real stuff. But I said, look, I, I thought it was... Uh, I thought it was noteworthy that you still feel this stuff personally and that it's not just